and by. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like to invite you to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. The book of Revelation, chapter 3. If someone next to you don't have a Bible, you might share yours with them. We can all read this scripture together. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, reading with verse 14. The book of Revelation, chapter 3, begin reading with verse 14. I ask that you pray for us this morning. No man in the world is able to, I guess, uh, preach God's Word exactly like it should could be preached. If you pray for us, we just do our best, the best that God can do with us, and uh, His will might be done. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 14. Book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be thou zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, the last church. The last church. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege and this opportunity that we have once again to bow in your presence and call thee our Father. We thank you, dear God, for amazing grace, amazing love, and amazing power. We thank you, our Father, for the love of God that was shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We thank you, Father, for another privilege to come to church on Sunday morning, look into your eternal word, Lord, and receive instruction from it. I pray, Lord, that you'd open our mind, our ears, and our thoughts, and our understanding, Lord, that we may receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our soul. We thank you, our Father, for the privilege of knowing thee. We thank you, Lord, for the truth. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit that enlightens our eyes and opens our eyes that we may see. I pray a special prayer for that one that may be sitting here in this building today who's still in darkness, who's still under the covering of of their sins, Lord. I pray that you would touch their hearts this morning. Help them, Lord, to be under conviction of sin and get their life right with thee before they leave this place. Do a miracle in in our midst this morning. Drive out every hindering force and power. We'll praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, the last church. The Word of God pictures here, and I believe in Revelation chapter 3, what I believe of the picture of the day that we're living in. In Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, you find that the, uh, the Lord told John to write letters to seven different churches. Now these were seven literal churches that were actually existing in that time, and I believe that these Seven churches represented uh, a message that could go to any church in any age, but it also represents seven periods of church history. And according to that, if that be true this morning, the church that we read about to you this morning is the last one of the seven. Now, if you've been, uh, we studied in our new converts class a few weeks ago, a little short study of numbers. And remember, we learned that the number seven represents spiritual completeness. It represents a, a cycle, the complete thing. 
God made the heaven and earth in six days, and on the seventh day, He rested. And that was the last day before it started up, excuse me, a new week again. And so God works in sevens. God deals with the number seven. There's so many times the number seven pops up in the Bible that first thing you know, you realize there's more to that number than what just meets the eye. There's seven notes on this piano over here. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. That's the only seven notes there is. And with flats and sharps, you come out with all these beautiful songs that people play. And every song you've ever heard played on the piano just was played from those seven notes. The only thing, the only seven tone. There's only seven colors that's represented. Uh, main colors. Primaries and secondaries. And of course black or white. Whichever one you want to argue is a color. And my dear friends this morning, every picture you ever saw painted in your life came from those seven colors. God stamped that number of seven of completeness upon the universe. Now in the Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we signed seven churches. Now, each one of these churches represents a period of church history beginning from the time the church first started, right after Jesus ascended and went back, and on the day of Pentecost, the church got going, up until the day that we're living in, or until Jesus comes back. Now, if I could show you by the Bible this morning that we're living in the days of the last church, I'd hope to stir your heart, if you're a Christian, to do something for the Lord, and then if you're not a Christian, to warn you and exhort you and to try to stop you and get you turned around in the right direction before Jesus comes and you get left behind. And so this morning, we're going to look at, at uh, these seven churches just a minute and focus our attention on number seven. Look back with me, if you will, at chapter two, and you see where John wrote the first letter to the first church. Now, we're just going to skim over these first six and then dwell, of course, on the seventh one this morning. In Revelation chapter 2 and verses 1 to 7, the Bible says that John wrote a letter to the church of Ephesus. And this, of course, would represent that first church up on the face of the earth after the Lord Jesus returned to glory and the church um, began to move. The Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 to 7 tells us the letter to the church of Ephesus. The word Ephesus means fully purposed. This church had a purpose and they stood for that purpose. And this would represent uh, uh, approximately until... Uh, the days that the church started until the days that the apostles died out. And after the days of the apostles died out, that would end this first period of church history. You pick up the second period of church history in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 8. And you see verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. And the name of this church is the letter to the church of Smyrna. The word Smyrna in Revelation 2, verses 8 to 11, comes from the word myrrh. And you remember seeing in those Christmas plays how the, the, the wise men or somebody brought myrrh and frankincense and gold to the baby Jesus? All right, myrrh is bitter perfume. And so the church in Smyrna would typify bitter suffering. And this is the persecution that they received from the time that the apostles died up until roughly the year 300 A.D. And then, of course, the church went through persecution all along, but that was bitter suffering to the church of Smyrna. And then the third church, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12 to verse 17, you find the angel to the church in Pergamos. The third church is identified by the name Pergamos. Now the word Pergamos means much marriage. And this church was married and intermarried and mixing in with the world. This represents a period of church history approximately from 300 A.D. to about 500 A.D. And the church then began to get involved with the world and mixing in with the world. You notice there that it said he had some there that taught the doctrine of Balaam and to commit fornication and 
to eat things sacrificed to, uh, uh, to idol. They mixed in with the heathen customs of the world and got all mixed up in a, it was a letter to the church of Pergamos. All right? The fourth church. The Bible tells us about it in Revelation 2, verse 18 to verse number 29. And that is the letter to the church called Thyatira. And the church of Thyatira, the word Thyatira means afflictions. And this, of course, was from about the year 500, roughly, to the year 1000 A.D. And that is the darkest ages that the world has ever known. It's known, you'll study that in school. They don't tell you about that in school. This is school. But they tell you in school that that's called the dark ages. And they tell you that everything, you know, was everything was so uh, heathenistic and pagan. That was during the period of the church of Thyatira, which means affliction. The next church in Revelation chapter 3, verse verses 1 to 6, is a letter to the church in Sardis. The word Sardis means red ones. In other words, they were red. This church was red and soaked in its own blood. And brother, this represents a period of church history from between about 1500 and about the time of 1700 when the Reformation started under Martin Luther. And the Word of God tells us here that the church in Sardis had uh, red ones. They were soaked. I mean, they, they, really, they really had a hard time. This was a period in church history. Brother, where they, where they tied them up in sacks of rattlesnakes and throwed them overboard in leather sacks of snakes into the water till the snakes bit them till they died. This is when they put them in barrels and drove nails in barrels all around the barrels. Put Christians in them and rolled them down the hill where those nails would drive into their temples. This is a this is period of church history where they come and jerk out one fingernail every day and the next day come and jerk off another fingernail and the next day come and jerk off another fingernail. You ever mashed your fingernail in the car door? That thing just boom, boom just throbs and you can't even sleep the first night after you do it real good. Well, they've done these one at a time on each ten fingers. This is a period of church history, brother, and these past three or four here during these times when Christians were thrown to the lines and beaten unmercifully and brother just treated like dogs. This is a period, brother, when they were soaked in their own blood. And then that brings us up to the sixth period of church history and the Word of God tells us it in verse 7, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, and to the church of Philadelphia. Now the word Philadelphia represents here, it means brotherly love. And this is the greatest period in the study of church history. This would represent from about uh, approximately 1500 or 1600 on up until about 19. Which brings us up to about 80 years ago, the period of Philadelphia, Revelation 3, verse 7 to about verse number 13. The Word of God tells us here that this church had brotherly love. And you'll notice that every church that God said something to in Revelation 2 and 3, He always told them what was wrong with them. But under the church in Philadelphia, the Lord didn't say one rebuke. He didn't rebuke them about anything. This was the church of the open door. And you realize that this was the greatest period of church history that the world has ever seen. This was the period of church history that new evangelists like D.L. Moody, like Martin Luther, like Sam Jones, and these guys that took the Word of God and preached, and literally thousands upon thousands of people got saved. This is a period of church history that God said, I've opened the door for you, and no man can shut it. But that brings us up under the last period of church history this morning, and that's in Revelation 3 and verse 14 to verse 22, the church of Laodicea. Now, if we've got all of those other six church periods history placed right in the study of history, then we have got to be living in that last one. Started about 1900, and right here at 1980, we're still in the seventh period of church history, the period of the Laodicean church. I guess some of you is wondering, what's he going to say that Laodicea means? Well, I'll tell you what it means. The word Laodicea means civil rights or rights of the people. And if there is one word that describes the activity going on in this age that we're living in, it's that word, rights. 
Right. Have you noticed how that all you hear about now is everybody wanting their rights? I've got rights. I want my rights. I've got my rights. He's pushing my rights. We've got our rights to live as we want. The women's rights, the gay rights. You know, everybody wanting their rights. You hear a lot about the ERA, Equal Rights Amendment. That's not really what it stands for. It stands for Eve ruined Adam. And brother, you hear a lot about uh, the women's rights and the gay liberation rights. And there were literally millions of homosexuals parading down the street with big old signs saying, I'm gay and I'm proud. I'm out of the closet. I ain't never going back in. And we demand our rights to be treated like a citizen. We want to teach in the public schools. We want to do this. We want to do that. Well, I tell you what, brother, I sure wouldn't want one teaching my little girl in school. I wouldn't want a drunkard teaching my little girl in school. I wouldn't want a prostitute teaching my little girl in school. Because if they can't get their own life straightened out, they can't help our kids. And, you know, the half generation these days we're living in, they can't straighten nobody else's life. They can't straighten their own life out. They can't straighten their hair out. Amen. And I want to say the church age that we are living in is the age of rights. Everybody demanding their rights. Brother, that's a church. That's the last church. Do you realize what I'm saying this morning? If what I'm saying up here this morning is true, we're living in the last period of church history before Jesus Christ comes back to this earth again. And if you're not a Christian, you better get in on this thing because you'll fool around and get left behind to worship the Antichrist and the devil. I talked to a boy. I'll show you how in darkness this generation is. I talked to a boy the other day, and man, this guy is smart. Was president of the student body in high school, I think, and went on to college. And boy, he's learned all kind of stuff. And he's just so smart. Anything you bring up, he knows about. Except the Bible. And I began to talk to him about the Lord. And I, asked, I told him the Lord was coming soon, and, and the Antichrist was going to take over. And I said, have you ever heard of the Antichrist? And he said, no. I said, have you ever heard of the Mark of the Beast? And he said, no, never heard of it. Man, that guy's been to college. I mean, for, what do you do sitting around in there for years and years and years? Don't even know what the mark of the beast is. You know, the Bible, you know what the Bible says? The beginning of wisdom is a fear of the Lord. And it don't matter how much fact somebody can rattle you off the top of their head, if they don't fear God, they ain't got good sense. And the, way, the source of wisdom is the Word of God. I'm not saying anything's wrong with education. You ought to get all you can, but you ought to get some. And if you don't even know what's going on in this world, don't claim to be educated. The Word of God tells us there's a man coming and he's going to step out on the scene. And he's going to be a big super duper man and he's going to take over the world and brother, he's going to cause everybody to have a mark on their right hand, on their forehead. Without that mark, you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't get a job, you can't cash a check, you can't do anything. And brother, the Bible says he's the Antichrist, he's the devil going to take over this world. Have you ever noticed how a lot of people, you know, they interviewed people before the election and they said, who are you going to vote for? You're going to vote for Carter? You're going to vote for Reagan? You're going to vote for John Anderson? You're going to vote for somebody? You know, who are you going to vote for? And a lot of people gave this reaction. Well, one's about as sorry as the other. And if you put one in, you know, one of them, neither one of them make no good. So it's just flip a coin. It's just guess. It really don't make much difference. There isn't anybody to lead our people now. You notice that spirit in our world today? No confidence in our leader. You know, the Bible says, you know, not to speak evil of the ruler of thy people. They may not be perfect, but well, I mean, brother, if you just, just put one of us up there, look what a mess we'd make. And as far as I'm concerned, they can have it. I'm not, I don't want to be the president. I don't see why anybody would want to be. But what I'm saying is this. People don't have confidence in our leaders these days. And people are just saying, we need somebody to come along and get us out of those problems. We need somebody to come out and, and solve these problems we're having. We need somebody to come and straighten out the mess this world's in. And brother, that man is coming, but he's not the right one. He's the devil. There is a super human being coming to this earth. You want to know what the forecast is? Here it is. One of these days, the Lord's going to come. Bang! His people's going to be called up to meet Him in the air. He's not going to come to earth. We're going to go to meet Him in the air. And then the Bible says, the wicked one shall come. That wicked shall be revealed. 
and brother he'll take over and he'll rule the whole world and brother the world will be brought under one big governmental system and everybody that worships him and follows his system and takes his mark will be doomed and damned for all eternity and then after that period of time's over the Lord will come back again set up his kingdom on this earth rule it for a thousand years and then the great white throne judgment comes everybody that's died in their sins comes and stands before God at judgment we move into heaven and live happily ever after they go into hell to burn forever and ever and ever and that's all she wrote that, that, that ain't no more that's it that's the forecast and where we're at right now is the period just before Jesus comes. Say, so how do you know, Brother Danny? Because this is the last church. Look at verse 22 of Revelation chapter 3. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Now the Lord, when He said that, He wasn't just talking about these things that flap on the side of your head. He didn't, when the Lord said, He that hath an ear, because there's a lot of people that's got these things that don't hear. There's a lot of people that has these things that can't hear God's Word. And the Lord said, He that has an ear, that means you let it go way down in here and hear it with that inner ear. Hear it with that inner man. Hear it with your soul. Hear it with your heart. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Look at verse 22. What the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now up until this point, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, you find the word church, 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 over and over and over, over again. But after chapter 3 and verse 22, you don't find the word church mentioned again. That's it. It's gone. Look what happens in chapter 4 and verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as of a trumpet talking to me which said, Come up hither. There's the rapture. That's where John got caught up into heaven. Right after the seventh church, the Lord says, Come up hither. We go up yonder. And then, brother, as the old saying goes, all hell breaks loose down here. And I want to say down here is going to be bad. If you're here during that time, you're going to regret it. Let's look at what God said about the last church. Do you know, we're living in a time when they say that we're nearing a holocaust? Did you know people that don't even believe the Bible know that the world is headed for something big? Did you know scientists and atheists and people that don't even know anything about the Bible are saying that the world can't go on much longer? I ain't talking about a bunch of preachers. I'm not talking about prophets of doom and people that you think just say this to scare people to get them to live right. I'm saying this, brother. People that don't even know God, people that don't even know anything about the Bible are saying we've not got long on this planet. Something big is about to happen. We're nearing a big change. You know what the society we live in wants? They want, they want wealth without labor. They want knowledge without study. They want security without vigilance. They want freedom without combat. They want marriage without commitment. They want love without responsibility. And the, the society that me and you are living in is headed in a cycle. Did you know that history makes a cycle? You've heard that old saying, history repeats itself. Well, there is a cycle that civilizations in history make. And it just goes around in a circle. And they come back to this very same thing. Uh, a good small example of this is, is dresses. You remember, dresses used to be long, then they come up, then they went back down, and instead of, you know, they didn't really go down, they just, I mean, they didn't start putting more cloth on them, they just dropped them, you might say. They come down here and up here. But anyway, the styles went down. First thing you know, styles will go somewhere else, and the styles change, and it goes in a circle. People dress now like they used to about 40, 50 years ago, and it goes in a circle. History just goes in a cycle. But civilization this morning goes in a 200-year cycle. And it usually takes about 200 years for civilization to make this cycle. And the history repeats itself. And as Ben well said, those who will not learn from the mistakes of history are condemned to repeat them. And so the Bible teaches us this morning that to watch history and to pay attention for, to it. Listen, you'll see a picture of the United States and America in these nine steps. Then it's any civilization that you've ever read about or studied about will follow these nine steps. First, 
They go from bondage to spiritual faith. In other words, a revival. If a nation's in bondage to a heathen nation, they have a revival. They go from bondage to spiritual faith. They go from spiritual faith to great courage. Number three, they go from great courage to freedom. Number four, they go from freedom to abundance. Number five, they go from abundance to selfishness. Number six, they go from selfishness to complacency. Number seven, they go from complacency to apathy. That means they just don't care. Number eight, they go from apathy to dependence. And then number nine, from dependence back into bondage. That is a cycle that history carries. A nation starts out, they get right with God. They have a revival. They really do good. First thing you know, they get selfish. First thing you know, they get wicked. They start depending on other countries to keep them up. And then right back into bondage where they came from. Now, according to those nine steps in history, we're about on verse or number nine right now. Dependence. Dependence. We're depending upon other folks and other countries just about right now to keep us a-going. And the next step is back in the bondage. That's where we're at, folks, in history. In 1971, four million college students said they believed that the best thing that happened to America would be an overthrow of the government and a new system brought in. That's 1971. The big revolutionary age. You know, when they had Woodstock, the big rock concert up north, and that was, it, it marked a turning point, brother. I mean, they said people that went to Woodstock in 1969 never was the same. I believe it was in 69. And up there when they had Woodstock, they had big old tables set out, and all the hippies would come around, and they were giving out Marxist literature and communist literature, and they were giving out big pieces of paper, the books, and the name of those books was How to Have a Revolution in America. And that was the doctrine being pushed. And was being pushed by the songs, the lyrics, and the lifestyle of just saying, we're rebelling against the United States government. We're rebelling against Uncle Sam. We'll burn our draft cards. We're going to overthrow the government. We're living in a day when people know that a big change is upon us and that a time has come for a change. And did you know that 1980 has been called the decade of destiny. We're living in the last score before the year 2000. In less than 20 years from now, the year 2000 will roll around. On July the 24th, 1980, the following warning was given by a commission that had just completed a three-year study. Here's what this commission said. Been studying for three years on the rate that the world's going and what will the world be like if it's here by 19 or by the year 2000. And you've got to remember that these statements wasn't made from preachers and prophets of doom, but they were made from people who were trained in their fields and environmental protection and family planning and they were employed by the government of the United States. In other words, they just didn't go out here and pick up a guy off the street and he made these prophecies. These people studied this. They know what they're talking about. They say by the year 2000, four out of every five people will live in an underdeveloped country. Even without inflation, food prices will double. Most nations will have more people, yet less food than they have today. At least one half of all the world's oil will be gone. Demand for firewood, the world's most widely used fuel, will exceed supply by at, least, by at least 25%. In other words, there ain't going to be enough wood to go around and burn to keep everybody warm. As the forests get burned up and are used up, we'll see 20% of the world's animals and plant species vanish, lost forever. The use of fossil fuels and organic chemicals will cause the earth's air mass to heat up, producing air loaded with carbon dioxide and rain that is acid. We are ripe for a super leader. We need a super leader. It will take a superpower to solve these problems. And the Bible says, when they hollow these things, and they say, send us a leader, send us a leader, there is 
a leader coming. And the Bible said He calls all, both small and great, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And that no man could buy or sell save he that had the mark. Brethren, I want you to know this morning, we are living in the days of the last church. You remember me telling, Brother Ed, telling back in June? How close are we to that, preacher? Brother Ed Mack be told right here from this pulpit in the last June, you that wasn't here, down in Gastonia, back in the beginning of this year, a lady got her a check from the Internal Revenue Service. As she went to cash this check, or before she ever cashed it, she looked, and you know how a government check is on the back, they got some lines back there and you have to sign it and fill in some stuff. And brother, on the back of this check it says, this check, do not cash unless the bear has a mark on the right hand. And of course, this lady had never served in her life saw a check like that. And she began to wonder about what was going on. Got some of her friends together and took it down to the bank and wanted an explanation of what was going on. And they said, well, there's just been some kind of mistake made. We'll take care of that for you and send it back. And she said, no, I want to know what this thing is all about. She happened to be a Christian and knew what the Bible said about that. And she said, I want to know what's going on, man. When they start sending you a check, say you've got to have a mark on your right hand to get it cashed. Something fishy's going on. Brother, she, they got the checking into it. And lo and behold, some the like circumstances started happening in several places across the United States. Dr. Greg Dixon, pastor of Indianapolis Baptist Temple in Indianapolis, Indiana, sent out a newsletter telling of a confirmed fact that a lady out in California had got the very same kind of check with the very same thing wrote on the back of it. Do not cash unless they have the mark on their right hand. And she went and demanded an explanation. And they sent it back and they sent it in the, in the IRS and it's hard to get them to admit they made a mistake, you know. And they finally did admit that a mistake had been made. And just not long ago, article come out, and I'll read it to you, in an actual paper, and here's what it said. What I can't figure out is how all them smart people miss all this stuff. IRS requires hand and forehead number. Hand or forehead number. During the months of July and August 1980, the Internal Revenue Service made a mistake that it wishes could be reversed. Reports from several states, Kentucky, Indiana, Maryland, you know government checks have special printed paragraph on the back with instructions and requirements for cashing. Normally, it states that a proper identification must be shown with the check being endorsed at the time of the cashing. The instructional paragraph on these checks was changed to read that the party cashing the check must have the proper identification mark in the right hand or forehead. Without it, the check could not be cashed. Naturally, the banks as well as the receivers of the check were surprised, confused, and frustrated. In spite of all demands, the banks refused to cash any of the checks. They said, to make a long story short, they demanded the IRS what was wrong, and the IRS finally wrote them back and said that the big giant computer had made a mistake, and this computer was not in, in, in the right, uh, you know, in the right uh, operation when it done this, and that these checks were not to be mailed out until 1984. In other words, they're already there. They've already got them printed up. They know that this world is headed under one world system under a mark. And brethren, they've already got your check made out what you're going to make your payday in the tribulation and you don't get it changed until you've got the mark on your hand or on your forehead. Now listen, folks, those checks are planning on coming out in 1984. We're, less, we're about six weeks away from 1981. 
We're living in the days of the last church. I'm not saying that is the mark of the beast, but brother, it sure is getting close to it. And it very well could be used by the Antichrist himself as a system of government. You see, everybody sitting there here, they say like this. We well, see, our problem in our society is cash. All right, we got too much cash flowing around. Little old ladies are afraid to walk down the street, afraid they'll be mugged. So what we'll do, we're going to do, do away with cash. And we're going to put you a mark on your right hand. And this mark can only be seen when you put it under a special light down at the cash register. And everything that you make on your job, you won't touch your money. It'll automatically be deposited in the bank. And when you go down to the grocery store and push your buggy through there, brother, you can get all the stuff that you want, and you come up to the grocery counter there and get ready to check it out. And instead of pulling out your billfold and paying with it with cash, you stick your hand under there, they check your number, that connects in with the big computer downtown, and immediately flashes how much money you've got in the bank, whether or not to cover your groceries. And every bit of it's done clean and neat, and the cash, nobody has any cash whatsoever. And brother, you don't have to worry about being robbed. You don't have to worry about somebody stealing your purse. You don't have to worry about... If you think about that. People's going to go wild over that. They'll say, wow, this is the greatest thing that ever happened. It's going to stop all this drug traffic out here. All these people selling drugs and everything. That'll cut it out. Man, that's the best thing that could happen to the United States. And this big dude will come in saying, peace, 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 peace. All is well. There is no hell. Everything's fine. Eat, drink, and be merry. We're going to solve the world's problem. But the Bible said in the book of 1 Thessalonians, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. We're living in the days of the last church, friend. We don't know how much longer we've got. I want to give you, secondly, this morning, the condition of the last church. These are some of the things that why I believe this was the last church this morning. I want to give you what the Bible said about the condition of the last church. Did you know of all the churches, God told them what was good and God told them what was bad. But in the last church, the church of Laodicea, in Revelation 3, 14 to 22, the Lord doesn't have one good thing to say about this last church. He don't have anything to say about it. It's just that it makes him sick. When God looks down at this last church and He sees how they're living and He sees the Pope and He sees uh, all of that mess and He sees everything going on in the name of religion and He sees big giant buildings, millions and millions of dollars spent on them while the world's going to hell. God looks and He says, you'll make me sick. You make me want to throw up. That's what God thinks about the last church, brother. It's the condition of it. Neither hot nor cold. Just sickening, old sickening, lukewarm water. I can drink hot water better than I can drink lukewarm. Cold water is good, hot water is good, but can you imagine old lukewarm water? It was like somebody spitting in your mouth. That's what God said about this last church. He said, you make me sick. Oh, he said, you're rich and increased with goods. And boy, they say the church is doing better now than it's ever been. Brother, they say nowadays we're increased with goods and have need of nothing. So don't you think we ought to pray? We don't need to pray. Don't you think we ought to have a revival? We don't need a revival. They say that they have need of nothing. God said you don't realize that you're miserable, wretched, poor, and blind, and naked. You know, the church, the early church starting out, they didn't have stained glass windows. They didn't have carpet on the floor. They didn't have money in the bank. But they had the power of God. And you know that the, 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 one of the bishops or somebody had a preacher in a Catholic church one day, and he's showing him all the riches over in the Vatican of the Catholic church. And he's showing him all them jewels and diamond and rubies and all the great riches. And he said, well, you know, no longer does the church have to say silver and gold have I none. And the preacher looked back at him and said, yeah, that's right, but neither can the church say rise up and walk. And brother, I want to say this morning, we've got the silver, we've got the gold, but this last church don't have the power the first church had to say rise up and walk. Those that are spiritually lame in this world. That's a condition of this last church. The church needs to be brighter than it's ever been before, but it's weaker 
and it's ever been before. All right, and finally, in closing this morning, God's message to the last church. What is God wanting to say to you and I? If God wants to speak to this last church this morning, what would he say? First of all, he said in verse 18, I counsel thee. God wants to give us some counsel. To buy gold tried in the fire. Get real. Get the real thing. Get faith. You may really be rich. God's chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. Brother, if you really want to be rich, God says, get you some gold that's tried in the fire. Get your faith right. And then God said his message to the last church in verse 19, I love you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Listen, folks, God loves the last church. God loves us here this morning. If you're here this morning, your life's in danger, and maybe you don't know which way you're going. Maybe you just got so many sins. Maybe you just went out Friday night and got drunk. Maybe you just went out there, you've been partying all week, and, you've been, and you just think, oh, boy, I feel terrible. I, did you know that God loves you? God loves you. A lot of people think, oh, no, God's getting ready to kill me. He's getting ready. He don't want to talk to me. That's not the way it is. God loves you, brother. God loves you, sister. God loves you so much that He let His Son die for you. God loves you this morning. If you're here and your life's in sin and your life's tangled up and you don't know which way is up spiritually, let me tell you the message that God gives to you. He loves you. And then He said, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. God's message to the last church is this. They've pushed me out. They don't need me in church anymore. They got it all worked out on their own. All the programs, all their methods, all their, and I'm on the outside knocking, won't me in. That's the picture of the last church, brother. We got Jesus pushed completely out of it. We got it so streamlined and organized, and he's at the door knocking, won't me in. I want you to know, brother, what the Bible says, if any man hear my voice. You know what I thank God for this is? If that's this, the last church, we're living in a day when church, you, you won't find the whole church right with God. If you, if you are looking for a church that everybody in it just right and everything just perfect, you're going to have a long, long look. If that church got more than three people in it. And if it ain't, it ain't a church. You say, what about where two or three are gathered together in my name? Brother, there's got to be believers gathered together and organized themselves together and committed together to make a church. That means family. It don't mean just like me and Dale and Gene here. We couldn't just say, well, we're a church. Not really, not scripturally speaking. I want to say to you this morning, my friend, where we two or three meet together, the Lord is in their midst, but in the church, brother, He said, it's on an individual basis. The whole church, the whole Methodist church, the whole Southern Baptist Convention, they ain't going to get right with God. Don't look for it. Don't expect it. United Presbyterian Church, the Independent Baptist, uh, the Methodist, Pentecostals, don't look for all everybody to get right with God. But the Lord says this. He said, I'm at the door knocking, and if just one of you hears my voice and opens the door, I'm, I'll sup with that one. And I know people right now, dedicated Christians, that are living in, that go to worldly, dead, formal churches. Nobody ain't been saved in in two or three years. But yet that person's setting their light on fire for Jesus. And brother, the reason they are is because they heard the voice of Jesus knocking and they said, I'll come in. I'll sup with you and with me. Do you know this morning that I read a story about a, a, a big a building, a sanatorium that caught on fire? And some men was going to rescue the people out of that sanatorium. And as they did, the firemen put a net down there. And they said, jump, jump, jump. The building's on fire. And the men just came a-leaping out of that building so fast that they couldn't hardly take them all. And there was one man standing up there that he, that he, he was afraid to jump. And he wouldn't jump. And they hollered, jump, jump. 
And he said, I, I can't. I'm scared to jump. I'm afraid the net won't hold me. And they hollered, the net's safe. The net's safe. It'll help you. It'll catch you. Just jump into it. We'll catch you. And he was afraid to. And he backed off out of the way from the ledge. And he went back into the building. Later, after the fire was put out, they found his charcoal body laying in there where he perished in those flames because he would not trust the net and the way of escape. And I want to say that could be the condition that somebody in this church is in this morning. You know that you're in a burning building. You know this world's headed down. You know it's only going to be a certain amount of time till they start pushing buttons and we're going to be in a war. You know that just as sure as you're sitting here. And we're here spreading the net. And we're saying Jesus will help you. Jesus will help you. But you're too scared to jump. You're too scared. And you know He's there. And you know He's here at this altar. But you won't jump. You're afraid. And if you don't watch it, you're going to back off and be destroyed with the rest of this world if you don't watch out. Let me say you only have one hope. Are you afraid to trust Jesus Christ to save you this morning? He's your only hope. If He don't help you, you'll go down with the rest of this world. That's the message to the last church, folks. Repent. Or... Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. This is nearly 1981, folks. You're going to sleep right on through the rapture. You're going to keep fooling around, fooling around, say, well, I got some running around I want to do this week. And I'm going to do this this week. And I'm going to get drunk this week. And I'm going to, I'm going to gamble this week. And I'm going to commit adultery next week. And I ain't going to get saved yet. You're going to keep fooling around, fooling around until God says, come up hither. His children's gone. And you'll be left behind to take the mark. You say, I just don't know if I can trust that. You're just like that man in that building afraid to jump. You'll perish in the flames, brother, because you're afraid. While the piano begins to play softly this morning, we're going to stand and sing in just a moment after we have prayer. Christians, I want you to pray right now. Pray that God's Spirit will do a miracle. I know we're living in days of apathy and apostasy. But I believe, brother, where, the, where great, sin did abound, grace did much more abound. The Lord's grace is still wanting to reach out and save somebody this morning. You know that God may be speaking to somebody sitting in these pews right now. You're not here by an accident this morning, friend. God brought you here. He loves you. He wants to help you. If you're out of God's will, God wants to help you get back in it. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, the Lord wants to save you this morning. You might say, well, Brother Danny, I belong to a church, or I go to church over here, or I do this, or I do that, but somehow or another, when you start talking about Jesus coming back, I get all nervous, and I get scared. Maybe that's because you're not ready. Maybe you need to trip to this altar to get ready. We don't pull nobody, or scare nobody, or jerk nobody's arm. We just try to give you the facts and let you do what you want to with it. It's completely up to you. If I could decide for you, I'd do it, but I can't. But I do want to encourage you. Make it right with Jesus before it's too late. This is the last church age that the world will ever see. God help you to make it right today before you leave. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, oh God, that you'd do a miracle right here. Lord, I feel so helpless, Lord, because I can't do it. God, I'm calling on the one that can. I'm asking you, by your power, move in on this service, convicting power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, we prayed all week. We prayed last night. Do a work in our midst, Lord. We're leaving it up to you now to speak to hearts, help that man, that woman, that boy or girl that needs to just to step out of that pew and make their way down to this altar to get it settled right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Long story short, they demanded the IRS what was wrong, and the IRS finally wrote them back and said that the big giant computer had made a mistake, and this computer was not in, in, in the right, uh, you know, in the right uh, operation when it done this, and that these checks were not to be mailed out until 1984. 
In other words, they're already there. They've already got them printed up. They know that this world is headed under one world system under a mark. And brethren, they've already got your check made out what you're going to make your payday in the tribulation and you don't get it cashed until you've got the mark on your hand or on your forehead. Now listen, folks, those checks are planning on coming out in 1984. We're, less, we're about six weeks away from 1981. We're living in the days of the last church. Now, I'm not saying that is the mark of the beast, but brother, it sure is getting close to it. And it very well could be used by the Antichrist himself as a system of government. You see, everybody sitting there here, they say like this. We well, see... Our problem in our society is cash. I, we got too much cash flowing around. Little old ladies afraid to walk down the street, afraid they'll be mud. So what we'll do, we're going to do, do away with cash. And we're going to put you a mark on your right hand. And this mark can only be seen when you put it under a special light down at the cash register. And everything that you make on your job, you won't touch your money. It'll automatically be deposited in the bank. And when you go down to the grocery store and push your buggy through there, brother, you can get all the stuff that you want, and you come up to the grocery counter there and get ready to check it out. And instead of pulling out your billfold and paying with it with cash, you stick your hand under there, they check your number, that connects in with the big computer downtown, and immediately flashes how much money you've got in the bank, whether or not to cover your groceries. And every bit of it's done clean and neat, and the cash, nobody has any cash whatsoever. And brother, you don't have to worry about being robbed. You don't have to worry about somebody stealing your purse. You don't have to worry about... It. You think about that. People's going to go wild over that. They'll say, wow, this is the greatest thing that ever happened. Going to stop all this drug traffic out here. All these people selling drugs and everything. That'll cut it out. Man, that's the best thing that could happen to the United States. This big dude will come in saying, peace, 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 peace. All is well. There is no hell. Everything's fine. Eat, drink, and be merry. We're going to solve the world's problem. But the Bible said in the book of 1 Thessalonians, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. We're living in the days of the last church, friends. We don't know how much longer we've got. I want to give you, secondly, this morning, the condition of the last church. These are some of the things that why I believe this was the last church this morning. I want to give you what the Bible said about the condition of the last church. Did you know of all the churches, God told them what was good and God told them what was bad. But in the last church, the church of Laodicea, in Revelation 3, 14 to 22, the Lord doesn't have one good thing to say about this last church. He don't have anything to say about it. It's just that it makes him sick. When God looks down at this last church and He sees how they're living and He sees the Pope and He sees uh, all of that mess and He sees everything going on in the name of religion and He sees big giant buildings, millions and millions of dollars spent on them while the world's going to hell. God looks and He says, you'll make me sick. You make me want to throw up. That's what God thinks about the last church, brother. The condition of it. Neither hot nor cold. Just sickening. Oh, sickening lukewarm water. I can drink hot water better than I can drink lukewarm. Cold water is good. Hot water is good. But can you imagine old lukewarm water? It was like somebody spitting in your mouth. That's what God said about this last church. He said, you make me sick. Oh, he said, you're rich and increased with goods. And boy, they say the church is doing better now than it's ever been. Well, they say nowadays we're increased with goods and have need of nothing. So don't you think we ought to pray? We don't need to pray. Don't you think we ought to have a revival? We don't need a revival. They say that they have need of nothing. God said you don't realize that you're miserable, wretched, poor, and blind, and naked. You know, the church, the early church starting out, they didn't have stained glass windows. They didn't have carpet on the floor. They didn't have money in the bank. But they had the power of God. And you know that the, 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 one of the bishops, somebody had a preacher in a Catholic church one day, and he's showing him all the riches over in the Vatican of the Catholic church. 
And he's showing all them jewel and diamond and ruby and all the great riches. And he said, well, you know, no longer does the church have to say silver and gold have I none. And the preacher looked back at him and said, yeah, that's right, but neither can the church say rise up and walk. And brother, I want to say this morning, we've got the silver, we've got the gold, but this last church don't have the power the first church had to say, rise up and walk. Those that are spiritually lame in this world. That's a condition of this last church. The church needs to be brighter than it's ever been before, but it's weaker than it's ever been before. All right, and finally in closing this morning, God's message to the last church. What is God wanting to say to you and I? If God wants to speak to this last church this morning, what would He say? First of all, He said in verse 18, I counsel thee. God wants to give us some counsel. To buy gold tried in the fire. Get real. Get the real thing. Get faith. You may really be rich. God's chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. Brother, if you really want to be rich, God says, get you some gold that's tried in the fire. Get your faith right. And then God said his message to the last church in verse 19, I love you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase them. Listen, folks, God loves the last church. God loves us here this morning. If you're here this morning, your life's in danger and Maybe you don't know which way you're going. Maybe you just got so many sins. Maybe you just went out Friday night and got drunk. Maybe you just went out there. You've been partying all week and you've been, and you just think, oh boy, I feel terrible. I, did you know that God loves you? God loves you. A lot of people think, oh no, God's getting ready to kill me. He's getting ready. He don't want to talk to me. That's not the way it is. God loves you, brother. God loves you, sister. God loves you so much that He let His Son die for you. God loves you this morning. If you're here and your life's in sin and your life's tangled up and you don't know which way's up spiritually, let me tell you the message that God gives to you. He loves you. And then he said, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. God's message to the last church is this. They pushed me out. They don't need me in church anymore. They got it all worked out on their own. All the programs, all their methods, all the way, and I'm on the outside knocking, won't me in. That's the picture of the last church, brother. We got Jesus pushed completely out of it. We got it so streamlined and organized, and he's at the door knocking, won't me in. I want you to know, brother, what the Bible says, if any man hear my voice. You know what I thank God for this is? And that's this. The last church. We're living in a day when church, you, you won't find the whole church right with God. If you, if you are looking for a church that everybody in is just right and everything just perfect, you're going to have a long, long look. If that church got more than three people in it. And if it ain't, it ain't a church. He said, what about where two or three are gathered together in my name? Brother, there's got to be believers gathered together and organize themselves together and committed together to make a church. That means family. It don't mean just like me and Dale and Gene here. We couldn't just say, well, we're a church. Not really, not scripturally speaking. I want to say to you this morning, my friend, where we two or three meet together, the Lord is in their midst, but in the church, brother, He said, it's on an individual basis. The whole church, the whole Methodist church, the whole Southern Baptist Convention, they ain't going to get right with God. Don't look for it. Don't expect it. United Presbyterian Church, the Independent Baptist, uh, the Methodist, Pentecostals, don't look for all everybody to get right with God. But the Lord says this. He said, I'm at the door knocking, and if just one of you hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and I'll sup with that one. I know people right now, dedicated Christians, that are living in, that go to worldly, dead, formal churches. Nobody ain't been saved in in two or three years. But yet that person's setting their light on fire for Jesus. And brother, the reason they are is because they heard the voice of Jesus knocking and they said, I'll come in. I'll sup with you and with me. Do you know this morning that I read a story about a, fa- a, a big a building, a sanatorium that caught on fire? And some men was going to rescue the people out of that sanatorium. And as they did, the firemen put a net down there. 
And they said, jump, jump, jump. The building's on fire. And the men just came a leaping out of that building so fast that they couldn't hardly take them all. And there was one man standing up there that he, that he, he was afraid to jump. And he wouldn't jump. And they hollered, jump, jump. And he said, I, I can't. I'm scared to jump. I'm afraid the net won't hold me. And they hollered, the net's safe. The net's safe. It'll help you. It'll catch you. Just jump into it. We'll catch you. And he was afraid to. And he backed off out of the way from the ledge. And he went back into the building. Later, after the fire was put out, they found his charcoal body laying in there where he had perished in those flames because he would not trust the net and the way of escape. And I want to say that could be the condition that somebody in this church is in this morning. You know that you're in a burning building. You know this world's headed down. You know it's only going to be a certain amount of time till they start pushing buttons and we're going to be in a war. You know that just as sure as you're sitting here. And we're here spreading the net. And we're saying Jesus will help you. Jesus will help you. But you're too scared to jump. You're too scared. And you know He's there. And you know He's here at this altar. But you won't jump. You're afraid. And if you don't don't watch it, you're going to back off and be destroyed with the rest of this world if you don't watch out. Let me say you only have one hope. Are you afraid to trust Jesus Christ to save you this morning? He's your only hope. If He don't help you, you'll go down with the rest of this world. That's the message to the last church, folks. Repent or perish. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. This is nearly 1981, folks. You're going to sleep right on through the rapture. You're going to keep fooling around, fooling around, say, well, I got some running around I want to do this week. And I'm going to do this this week. And I'm going to get drunk this week. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gamble this week. And I'm going to commit adultery next week. And I ain't going to get saved yet. You're going to keep fooling around, fooling around until God says, come up hither. His children's gone. And you'll be left behind to take the mark. You say, I just don't know if I can trust that. You're just like that man in that building afraid to jump. You'll perish in the flames, brother, because you're afraid. While the piano begins to play softly this morning, we're going to stand and sing in just a moment after we have prayer. Christians, I want you to pray right now. Pray that God's Spirit will do a miracle. I know we're living in days of apathy and apostasy. And I believe, brother, where the where grace seemed to abound, grace did much more abound. The Lord's grace is still wanting to reach out, to save somebody this morning. You know that God may be speaking to somebody sitting in these pews right now. You're not here by an accident this morning, friend. God brought you here. He loves you. He wants to help you. If you're out of God's will, God wants to help you get back in it. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, the Lord wants to save you this morning. You might say, well, Brother Danny, I belong to a church, or I go to church over here, or I do this, or I do that, but... Somehow or another, when you start talking about Jesus coming back, I get all nervous and I get scared. Maybe that's because you're not ready. Maybe you need to trip to this altar to get ready. We don't pull nobody or scare nobody or jerk nobody's arm. We just try to give you the facts and let you do what you want to with it. It's completely up to you. If I could decide for you, I'd do it, but I can't. But I do want to encourage you. Make it right with Jesus before it's too late. This is the last church age that the world will ever see. God help you to make it right today before you leave. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, oh God, that you'd do a miracle right here. Lord, I feel so helpless, Lord, because I can't do it. God, I'm calling on the one that can. I'm asking you, by your power, move in on this service convicting power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, we prayed all week and we prayed last night. Do a work in our midst, Lord. We're leaving it up to you now to speak to hearts, help that man, that woman, that boy or girl that needs to just to step out of that pew and make their way down to this altar and get it settled right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.